to the Election 2020 Project in our second part of America's Place in the World. I'm Patrick Ryan, President of the Tennessee World Affairs Council. This evening, we welcome two distinguished American diplomats who have well over a half century of foreign service for the United States between them. They will be, they will be uh, guided through our conversation of the international landscape and where the United States fits in by Professor Thomas Schwartz. First, let me thank our partners for this program in the uh, being the Nashville Area Chamber of Commerce and the uh, Center for International Business at Belmont University. Uh, tonight, we're also joined in this effort with our sister uh, World Affairs Council in Peoria. We hope you watched part one of this topic two weeks ago. Professor Schwartz talked with General John Allen, president of Brookings and retired USMC four-star general and Dr. Jessica Tuckman Matthews, former president of Carnegie Endowment of International Peace. It was a must-see program. If you missed it or want to refer it to your friends, uh, you'll find it along with all of our other Election 2020 programs and all TNWAC webinars on our youtube.com slash TNWAC channel. Lastly, a brief invitation for you to become members of the Tennessee World Affairs Council or to make a gift to the council. That's how we stay in business visit tnwac.org to do so. And for the students of Professor Schwartz's uh, class on the Cold War, I'm sure you'll have many good questions to add to our queue uh, so you can get additional extra credit tonight. On to our program. Thomas Allen Schwartz is a historian of the foreign relations of the United States with related interests in American politics, the history of international relations, modern European history and biography. He is on the faculty of Vanderbilt University. His most recent book is Henry Kissinger and American Power, a political biography. The book has received considerable notice and acclaim. I read it and suggest you do too. Now I'm privileged to introduce and welcome two distinguished Americans to our panel. In the interest of time, let me refer you to our website for more complete biographical information. Still, I'd like to uh, give you a true sense of their service to the nation and accomplishments. Ambassador John Kornblum has a long record of service in the United States and Europe, both as a diplomat and as a businessman. He is recognized as an eminent expert on US-European political and economic relations, in particular, Central and Eastern Europe. He served as ambassador from the United States to Germany from 1997 to 2001. He has also served as US Assistant Secretary of State for European Affairs, Special Envoy for the Dayton Peace Process, U.S. Ambassador to the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe, the Helsinki Process, Deputy U.S. Ambassador to NATO, and U.S. Minister and Deputy Commandant of Forces in Divided Berlin. He currently serves as Senior Counselor to the international law firm Noor LLP and is a Senior Advisor to the Worldwide Consultancy Accenture. Ambassador Kornblum is the member, member of uh, mem many boards, including the American Chamber of Commerce in Germany, the American Academy in Berlin, the Deutsche Oper in Berlin, and numerous nonprofit organizations on both sides of the Atlantic. He has been the recipient of many awards, including a Knight's Cross of the Order of Merit from Germany and an Order of Merit from Austria. Ambassador Thomas Pickering holds the personal rank of career ambassador, the highest in the US Foreign Service. In a diplomatic career spanning five decades, he was U.S. Ambassador to the Russian Federation, India, Israel, El Salvador, Nigeria, and the Hashemite Kingdom of Jordan. He served as the U.S. Ambassador and, and Representative to the United Nations in New York under President George H.W. Bush, where he led the U.S. effort to build a global coalition in the U.N. Security Council during and after the first Gulf War. He also served as the U.S. Undersecretary of State for Political Affairs under President Bill Clinton. Ambassador Pickering has also served on assignments in Zanzibar and Dar es Salaam, Tanzania. In Washington, he was Assistant Secretary of State for the Bureau of Oceans, Environmental and Scientific Affairs, Executive Secretary for the Department of State, and Special Assistant to Secretaries of State William P. Rogers and Henry A. Kissinger. I'd love to hear a conversation between you, Ambassador, and Professor Schwartz about his Kissinger book. After government, he was the Senior Vice President, International Relations of the Boeing Corporation. In 2012, Ambassador Pickering 
was uh, chosen to chair the Benghazi Accountability Review Board at the State Department. Ambassador Pickering received the Distinguished Presidential Award and the Department of State's highest award, the Distinguished Service Award. He is a member of the Council on Foreign Relations and the International Institute of Strategic Studies. He speaks French, Spanish, and Swahili, and has some fluence, fluency in Arabic, Hebrew, and Russian. Lastly, he is among the most indefatigable alums of the Tennessee World Affairs Council Distinguished Visiting Speaker Program, logging numerous appearances in Nashville in a day and a half at Rotary Clubs, classrooms, business groups, editorial boards, and the Tennessee World Affairs Council Global Town Hall, all of which we thank him for, for doing. So thank you to uh, both of these great friends of the Tennessee World Affairs Council for their participation here. And I now turn it over to Professor Tom Schwartz. Thanks very much, Pat. Um, and thanks to the Tennessee World Affairs Council for organizing the Election 2020 Project, in particular, the, these two programs on America's place in the world. I really am uh, very much uh, honored uh, to be able to moderate a discussion between the two ambassadors, and not just because both of them uh, know a great deal about the subject of my recent book, but they're both, they both have just exceptional, um, have both uh, uh, have exceptional service records to the country. Uh, and to our nation. Uh, and I, I think this is a, a real opportunity to dis explore their ideas on America's place in the world. Uh, what we decided to do was we to ask both of them for some opening remarks, um, uh, perhaps about uh, between five to seven minutes of, of remarks about the general topic, America's place in the world, what they want to speak about. And then we'll proceed to some more specific questions, uh, both partially based on what they have to say, but also on some of the questions that we've already uh, submitted. So uh, let me start with Ambassador Kornblum and ask him to um, give us some opening remarks. Thank you, Professor Schwartz. Uh, I'm very pleased to be here. I, you, I, uh, Pat, you forgot to mention that I am also coming to you from, from Nashville today, where I live at the moment, longer than I intended to, in fact, because of the virus, but I'm a very happy resident of Nashville. Um, my foreign service career was obviously for me fascinating, but it had an interesting time scope to it. I joined the foreign service in 1964 as a very young 21 year old, right as the Cold War had just about reached its depth. And I left in 2000 as the West, the United States in particular, but many others were celebrating the victory of Western liberal democracy over authoritarian communism, the reunification of Germany, the reunification of Europe, uh, and also the, the uh, hoped for entry of China into an active and positive role in the world. So I saw it from beginning to end and have now been watching it from the center of Europe where I live most of the time. And I think what I'd like to suggest in, on that basis is that uh, things have changed dram dramatically since the end of the Cold War. But at the same time, we're now finding ourselves, I say ourselves, I mean the United States, but also the West, in, with a very similar task. The task in the Cold War, and if uh, we happily have people like Tom Schwartz to, to catalog for us, the fact is that the concept of the West the unity of the West and the strategy which ended in the success of the Cold War was anything but a given in 1948-49. was exactly the opposite. And it was something that was built up over really two decades going into the 1960s and 70s. Here we are now again, 30 years after the official end of the Cold War. And instead of Russia as our main uh, opponent, we have China, a much bigger, much richer, and probably a much more creative country than Russia had has been recently anyway. And we are, some people are saying, here's another Cold War. There are lots of reasons not to use that term, but it's, it's, it's useful because it is also a question of whether the West will put itself together to meet the challenges which are coming from China. And the challenges from China, in my mind, of course, economic and technological, uh, but they are also, just as was the Cold War, they are, value-oriented, philosophical, and civilizational. We are now coming into a period of some sort of integrated, interconnected world 
based on digital uh, networks and the, the high technology for which the United States is uh, very well known. But at the same time, keeping this world order as democratic and as open as we were able to keep the post-Cold World War II world order is going to be a very major task. I'm not sure we understand that yet. The, the journals are filled now with new ideas about how to structure a world order based basically on the concepts of the Cold War. The new concepts are still not really known to us. And in fact, we don't really have a vocabulary for them. But my basic point would be, we're in the same job again, to build up the West as the foundation of an open, liberal, tolerant, peaceful world order. And if anything, it's probably more difficult than it was in the Cold War. We can say that with a certain distance since we, we did it successfully. It didn't look so good for many of the years. But it's more difficult because it's not as simple. The Cold War was a, was a post-World War II battle for the soul of Europe against a large but very slow and very uh, uh, dictatorial power. This time we were talking about an integrated world against a power which is many times larger than Russia, but also, as I suggested, many times more creative than Russia. And, and it's not autarkic the way the Russians were. So this is a really big job. And it, especially for, for, the, for the students who are here, this is a job which is just as important for the United States, for the leadership of the United States in the world as the Cold War ever could have been. Thanks. Thank you, Ambassador Kornblum. There's lots to, to work out there, but I'd like to turn it over to Ambassador Pickering for your reflections and thoughts as well on this um, situation that we, the United States finds itself in. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Schwartz. And thank you, Patrick, for the introduction and John Kornblum for a very, very stimulating and I think interesting introduction from his perspective to the problem, most of which I agree with entirely. Uh, I'd like to do three things. I'd like to talk a little bit about how we got where we are, a little bit of an assessment of where we are and what it means, and then perhaps some thoughts about fixing it. Uh, we got where we are over a period of 100 years. I read just a moment ago that in 1880, we were the world's richest country per, by per capita income, which is quite startling, as it happened earlier than I thought. Uh, in the World War, we were the indispensable final partner uh, to produce allied victory. Uh, we failed after that to take opportunities that were available to us in the League of Nations and in the world system. Uh, but in the Second World War, we were called upon again by a Japanese attack on us to requite all of that and to become a major player in the Second World War. There's no question at all that Russia made bigger sacrifices or the Soviet Union, uh, but we were in many ways the arsenal of democracy as we turned ourselves and following it, as John has I think so cleverly limbed out in the Cold War, we decided with some care to play a very careful but very significant role. We were in that sense the partner state to whom everyone returned as new crises arose uh, to ask us what we thought about those. In some ways that still hangs on. Uh, we were the progenitors of the Marshall Plan, the creation of NATO, and certainly we were major supporters of the European Union. In addition, we looked around the rest of the world for partnerships that in one way or another might play a significant role in that long contest. Much of that changed with the end of the Cold War. My own sense is that we adopted a pattern of less consultation with friends and allies, even in the 1990s than we had kept in the Cold War. And we began in one way or another to exercise uh, our approach to uh, international life more as someone who in one way or another was at the top of the heap and we knew it, uh, than someone who in one way or another had friends and allies and other partners to bring along. On the other hand, we never got ourselves involved in conflicts in places and in ways where we didn't have very strong supporting coalitions. In the new administration beginning four years ago, much of that changed. Some of it had in fact also run downhill in the course of our uh, interest and then invasion of Iraq, which in many cases people consider to be one of the 
uh, most egregious mistakes we have made in recent years. In those particular periods of time, uh, it is quite clear that, uh, particularly in China, uh, almost in a way that is perhaps overreaching to a significant degree, American decline has become the significant factor on the horizon, and one for Chinese, which for many of them is an inevitable and inexorable course of action taking us down. Uh, we will now have a chance in four days to vote to decide what is our future and how we should proceed. Our diplomacy in many ways has been based not only on our strengths, uh, which are obviously a major economy, a very significant military force, uh, a politics in my view that is surrounded by values and principles often unfortunately left aside by the United States, but which nevertheless still attract a great deal of attention and still inform us in our better moments uh, for how and in what way uh, we should as a democracy uh, and as a major plower, player on the world scene, uh, support uh, democratic values and support questions of respect, dignity and equality. Uh, in the period now facing us ahead, uh, we have an opportunity uh, to pick up the pieces and to begin again. The world has changed radically. As John pointed out, China and even Russia in some ways with its enormous nuclear power are still major factors on the horizon and the world has become in that regard more multipolar. Uh, our capacity in fact to produce alliances, to nurture alliances, to build coalitions is a strength which has been abandoned in the moment by something called America first, but really has become America only, unfortunately. If it were the former, we would have had more respect for others. And so that's part of the challenge of how we go ahead. Uh, will we in the, in the coming year and beyond be able to meet the myriad problems out ahead of us uh, from climate change and pandemics, uh, from economic recovery, I hope, uh, to domestic issues of uh, racial prejudice that still uh, undergirds and I think unfortunately inhabits the darker uh, recesses uh, of our own country uh, to questions of how to deal with China and Russia. The new administration, regardless of who wins this election, will have all of these problems on its plate and they will continue to be in many ways enormous. Many of them made worse, unfortunately, by the last four years, uh, but a lot of them in some ways, very much a product of what is even increasingly rapid global change. Certainly the information environment, the growth of technology, changes in many ways that people do business and conduct business will all be out there for us to deal with. Uh, we are in many ways with a weakened capacity in our diplomatic establishment to address these. In large measures, we have seen the scything through of the American diplomats, the foreign service that John and I proudly represented for many years of professional diplomacy, uh, that in its best days rivaled any in history. Uh, in its worst days was not any better <laughs> than the best, <laughs> but it nevertheless is uh, in many ways now had its leadership chopped off had public enthusiasm for participating in it reduced. And we hope that over time change will make a difference in that. But we've seen a heavy politicization of the State Department. But we've also seen an overmilitarization of our national security policy and foreign affairs, something that does need to be redressed because uh, we have the example of two wars in which we have participated, which continue to be endless with no settlement, either military or political in sight, unfortunately. These are all difficult problems. They're not easy for us in one way or another to address, but I look forward to responding to your questions. And if anybody was to ask me, what is my advice today? I would say, I don't care whether you're a Democrat or a Republican, please exercise your right to vote. We need you. We need a determination of how the American people wish to go ahead, and we need it in a clear and I think uh, responsive and in many ways significant way if we are in fact going to be able to pick up the pieces and move ahead as we should. I am not an American downer. Uh, we have much to offer. 
We are a great country. We need to recover a good bit of that. And a vote on election day that shows a remarkable turnout of the American public will be a significant start. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ambassador Pickering. I, um, both of you have given a lot of uh, uh, ideas that we can um, deal with in this discussion. I do want to start with China. Uh, that is, in terms, there haven't, there hasn't been a great deal of discussion of foreign policy in the campaign. I think you would both agree uh, to that. The the one issue that does come up a great deal is China. Uh, the president today said Joe Biden's owned by China. There there is this argument that China's influence has been um, uh, pernicious. It's its response to the pandemic and its uh, role there. Um, certainly China's role or China's, uh, the, the trade relationship with China, the security relationship with China, all of these things have, have certainly had uh, uh, echoes in the campaign and have had influence, at least if the, po the polls can be believed, have changed over the last few years into an American uh, uh, perception and uh, widely shared now on both political parties of this rivalry and even enmity toward China. Uh, if you were in the position of advising uh, the next president, uh, whoever wins the election, what are your thoughts about the best ways forward to dealing with China um, and what type of relationship should we seek uh, in uh, the relationship with China. Um, perhaps I'll start with Ambassador Corblu. Well, um, we always draw upon what we know. And I think that the period of the Cold War, which was uh, preceding this period, was one in which the United States developed a very, I would say skillful, I agree with Tom completely, um, talent, which we sometimes call statecraft. That is simply looking at the world that you're in, trying to figure out who and what is doing what to whom, shall we say, in this world, and then trying to build solutions from there. And I think that the way for us to approach China is very similar. Interestingly enough, this is something which I've puzzled about for the last 15 or so years, something we need a good historian for, that after we had spent so much time building up statecraft up through the year 2000, we somehow abandoned it. Maybe 9-11 played a role. Maybe it was the, uh, the letdown after the end of the Cold War, I'm not sure. But if you take a look at the 2000s, the 20 years now of the 2000s, it has essentially been an effort at American unilateralism whether it be George W. Bush and, and his crowd who tried to, you know, to change the Middle East and turn it into a democracy. But also, you know, let's be frank, um, Barack Obama was also a unilateralist. He was going to turn us into a Bible study group, if I may be so uh, bold. And now, of course, we have the, the, as we would say in Germany, the Ura unilateralist in Mr. Trump, who is going to combine everything into an American first nationalist. But the thing that I miss, and again, I realize that uh, I have drawing on my own past when I say this, is the statecraft, the careful putting together that we did during the 1960s and 70s, the careful putting together that we did in, in, in the Near East, not always successfully, but we did have two major steps forward uh, with the different two presidents who pushed us forward quite a lot the careful way we built our relationship with Russia. This now has all disappeared. And I think I have no great insights into China, but I do believe that we would do better if we get back to learning how to do statecraft, learning how to organize our interests and learning now that as all three of us said at the beginning here, that we're in a different world where everybody is integrated with everybody else. We can't compare China to the Soviet Union for many reasons, but one of them is we are so deeply integrated with China. We wouldn't have our iPhones if we didn't have China. Imagine that. Uh, and China, on the other hand, would lose a place where it uh, draws a lot of technology, most of it legally, I think, but also where they have hundreds of billions of dollars of investment in our, in our treasury bonds. 
This is not the same kind of relationship that we had with the Soviet Union. So it, it, it requires a great deal of new thinking, of new cre creativity, but I think that the foundation of it should be a return to statecraft. That's, it's interesting, of course, for you to mention the integration of the two. Uh, one could make the case that this actually is a situation more paralleling World War I, where Britain right. and Germany ended up going to war, even though they were economically integrated, and so that conflict can still come even when you're integrated. Uh, uh, Tom, power. if I may just yeah. interrupt, you may note that in his really, I think, quite good book about China called On China by Henry Kissinger, he spends a great deal of time talking about the German-British relationship, and he draws on the memorandum, which was written in the FCO at that time, to predict war with Germany. And so there is a certain amount of uh, a very close uh, proximity with, between the two problems. Right. Ambassador Pickering, would you like to, uh, again, what type of advice would you want to give a, a president uh, now dealing with what seems to be now a change? And I, I also want to add here that I, I think we, we do have a tendency always in the United States to to tend to, to think about our own presidential administrations as causing things, but there's also the argument that China itself has gone through a nationalist period and become much more uh, uh, assertive. And so that it's not just uh, American presidents, but we're also dealing with a different type of China. I'm wondering if you would well, like to talk about what advice you might want to give on this subject. Yeah, I, I might, I want to pick up where John took us to statecraft, because I think mm -hmm. that's important. I want to pick up with your reiteration of the question, which is very significant. I think that um, the US approach to China is characterized at the moment by two polar opposite views. And this may be also true about Russia, Iran, and other places. Uh, but one of those views is basically, it is only through extreme pressure uh, that we can bring about a result. And that much of that extreme pressure view is based on the notion that China is really the successor for the Soviet Union and the successor for intellectual global Marxism in seeking to become a world hegemon and seeking in one way either uh, to occupy or direct what goes on in each country uh, around the world. And at the same time, it undermines the notions that you have just put forward, which are very important, that China has its own problems. Its demography is aging. Uh, its economy in terms of uh, uh, size is well below ours, uh, in particularly in divided up into how uh, personal shares of GNP or GDP are divided out. Uh, it is heavily dependent on international commerce at the moment. It's seeking uh, to build itself uh, a domestic economy of more formidable proportions in terms of the domestic consumption of its own economic goods and services. So. Uh, the second view is that the, the, the Chinese have come up and they're going to come up and stay. Uh, and they do need uh, to be both forcefully pushed back, but equally deeply engaged. And that's the major difference between uh, view one and view two. And that China, whatever its ambitions might be, whether they are regional, whether they are national, or whether they are global, has to be dealt with and that it is our old trade and craft of diplomacy that is the first line of offense in dealing with China buttressed by the kind of leverage that we have a great capacity to bring to the show. But it is not leverage which punishes our own people at the expense of getting China to come along, whether by screwing up the soybean trade or by putting tariffs on Chinese goods which Americans end up paying. Uh, and at the same time, it's an approach that is based on real economics. The, the, the concern that uh, China and US trade balances don't match or that we are not totally favorable with China and every other country in the world is of course, probably nearly a mathematical impossibility. But the tr truth has been for many years that a combination of goods and services, not just manufactured goods, continues to put us in a very strong world trade position. And we should go after China on trade issues that involve theft of patents and so on, things that are really out of source. And we should do everything we 
you can to use China's position in the World Trade Organization to impose those rules rather than to screw up the World Trade Organization by withholding its capacity to make judgments about trade disputes and threatening to get out of it. And much of this is the same sort of thing in a different way with the World Health Organization and how and in what way we perhaps relinquished uh, too much uh, interest in the World Health Organization to afford it to the Chinese. And this kind of an approach, the, the first approach, leads to the resolution of issues only by demonization and not by foreign policy strategy. Uh, and we have to continue to go back to that in whatever way we can. Diplomacy isn't going to solve all problems all of the time everywhere, but it is a lot cheaper than military engagement. And military engagement, as we have seen in Iraq and Afghanistan, has not solved those problems, unfortunately. Can I uh, uh, ask a somewhat provocative question based a little bit on the, uh, the new rhetoric of the Trump administration toward China, namely, uh, and maybe I'll start with you, Ambassador Pickering, should the United States seek regime change in China? Should it seek, in a um, sense, that um, the um, Communist um, Party of China uh, somehow be, be removed or at least lose power? Tom, as an ideal one, would love to see the Chinese become Swiss Democrats. And so would we in Iran. The reality is it's like seeking regime change in heaven. There is no chance we will get there. And the Chinese will be in the long run, we hope the masters of their own fate and everything we can do in the course of bringing China and its approach to the world into the international community on the basis of a free and fair competition is what we should do, and that will help empower Chinese increasingly, whether they're in the Communist Party or on the street, uh, to make decisions about how China should proceed. And she's uh, capturing chairmanship for life, uh, is a real move away from 10-year terms. Whether that will ever come back in our lifetime, I do not know. Uh, but there are times when we clearly need to stand up uh, for the things that we think are most important and not abandon the globe on which we heavily depend for our survival on the basis that America first can solve everything and all we have to do is to hunker down and forget everybody else or use our power uh, to castigate them in the hopes that regime change will suddenly appear full blown uh, on the television screens tomorrow morning. Okay, well, um, Ambassador Kornblum, as a Cold War uh, veteran, um, having seen um, a regime change, in a sense, um, uh, how do you respond on that subject? What, what do you think uh, should be? Uh, well, that's an interesting term? point. Um, we were, in fact, seeking regime change in the Cold War. At least we were seeking, shall we say, a geopolitical change. We wanted to end the division of Europe and the... Uh, the sub submission of the Eastern European countries. But there used to also be a, a saying that was, you heard around Europe in those days, I like Germany so much, I'm glad there are two of them. Because not everybody wanted to see Germany reunified. Well, here I would turn it around on China. I love China so much that I want to see one of them. Uh, if we start mixing around too much, or if we have the wrong assessment of what's going on in China, we could end up with five Chinas. This is, in fact, more in the trend of Chinese history to have, and if you consider the Chinese communists to be just another dynasty, which many people do, dynasties in China tend to have a revolutionary phase. They tend to go up high and be very uh, creative and, and uh, successful, and they tend to decline. And the very um, um, the diversity and, and confrontational nature of Chinese society comes back. And we shouldn't forget that the organization that Tom and I so happily served for so many years was virtually torn apart in the 1950s over the question of who lost China. And, uh, and one of the reasons that, that the Foreign Service was almost torn apart in that period was because the United States 
believed we had to have regime change in China. I think I would hope that our statecraft has now taught us that to take on a country with a billion and a half people and tell them that we're going to do a Marshall Plan and set up an occupation regime and turn them all into dem democracies is a little bit too much even for the United States to take on. Okay. No, I appreciate that. Uh, and I appreciate the historical references as well. I, I'd like to switch our discussion, though we, we mentioned briefly um, the Middle East in, in the sense of both the failures of the United States there and the rest. Um, one other issue that has certainly come up in American policy over the last few years, and has been uh, one of the starkest reversals carried out by the Trump administration was the withdrawal from the JCPOA and the change in American policy toward Iran. Um, as you look forward, uh, do you, uh, of course, um, if there is a change in an American government with the Biden administration, there is this notion that we would go back into that uh, agreement. Um, let me also frame it here. One of the elements that the Trump administration has promoted is the idea that it has produced now peace agreements between Arab states and Israel. And one of the reasons for that, uh, that they have, of course, uh, uh, said is that the United States has taken on a tougher position toward Iran, and that has brought the Sunni Arabs in uh, uh, toward a, a willingness to recognize Israel. Um, as you see the situation with Iran in the Middle East, what do you think American policy should be there? And what uh, do you think we should, or how do, how do you think we should approach it? Uh, maybe I'll start with Ambassador Pickering. Thank you, Professor Schwartz. And um, a word up front, since 2001, I've been engaged in an uh, track to all non-official dialogue with Iranian uh, because I joined a small group that was feeling very much that the failure to have any contact with Iran was not serving our interests. And we still, I still believe that. Um, I believe that the um, uh, joint comprehensive plan of action, which uh, since we began in 2002 and have kept up, uh, serves uh, a number of important purposes, but is far from a perfect deal. Uh, my sense is that it was always meant to, particularly to help us over a five-year period uh, to slow and stop Iranian efforts that would take them closer to a nuclear weapon, if not to one. Um, but that it was meant to be, uh, sub, sub, uh, it was meant to be succeeded uh, by more negotiation uh, coming on to more uh, tighter and more long-lasting controls. Uh, other people have different views of that. Uh, our removal of ourselves from the agreement, which violated <clears throat> international law, since there was no way of getting out of the agreement, since we put it in that way, because we didn't want Iran to get out, uh, is in itself a very bad action uh, and has retarded things. Uh, Vice President Biden has said that he will rejoin the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action if Iran is willing to rejoin and observe all of its, uh, all of its strictures. Uh, and we would have to rejoin by uh, you know, taking off the nuclear sanctions we've added on since we left. I think that's a very important step and, and very significant. And I think it should be done very quickly because Iran will face elections in May and June, uh, which may well have a chance in the absence of forward progress in particular, bringing hardliners more into the, to the, to the program. Re renegotiating now that agreement would mean that we would face having to take it to the Congress. Rejoining it uh, legally would not require us to take it to the Congress. And in early days, particularly given the fact that many Democrats have deep concerns about Iran and deep distrust for Iran, having to go to the Congress now without continued Iranian good performance on the JCPOA would set the stage for a long delayed and perhaps bankrupt process uh, to move them ahead. And the outcome of that is much more openness on the part uh, of Iran in terms of restrictions on it to move further closer to a nuclear weapon, something that I think none of us want to see. Okay, um, yeah, Ambassador Kornblum, on the Middle East in general or just on Iran? Uh, well, how would you um, see it? I'll start with Iran. Um, again, go back to our basic point. One has to know who one is and what one's interests are. 
and the problem that we've had for many decades, and it got much worse after 9-11, <clears throat> was the fact that to many people in our country, I think we need to be honest about that, it looked as if a lot of this careful diplomacy that we were doing, and especially the JCPOA and other things, were allowing people like Iran, but also Syria and others, to run wild with terrorism. And uh, that is one thing, especially after 9-11, which was very hard for the American population to swallow. I understand that completely. And it was then in the, in the 2000s, first, especially in the first 10 years of the 2000s, a considerable militarization of our policy because we felt that terrorism was the really major goal that we had. But there's another major goal that we have, which I think mostly through luck, I don't know, Tom knows more about this than I do, but that, that we have, there hasn't been that much proliferation of nuclear weapons in the last 20 years. But you don't have to be too smart to build a nuclear weapon these days. And there are lots of people who are certainly rich enough to do it. And there are lots of people who feel somehow threatened or wronged or angry by somebody else who could do it. And the reason that the JCPOA, from my point of view, I'm far from an expert on this stuff, but was important was first, it was putting a process, a cap on the whole nuclear issue. But it also did something which was really extremely skillful on the people who were dealing with it. We gathered together the entire West, all of our European allies into a common position on non-proliferation. <laughs> and not that they're all in favor of proliferation, I didn't mean that, but I meant that it was a, really a, a position that the United States was defining and more or less leading. These are the kinds of things which are hard to explain. Again, I think both of us can, can give testimony to the fact how hard it is sometimes to explain diplomacy to American congressmen. I can tell you some really funny, fun discussions I had about that. But the fact is that going to Iran and engaging them is in our interest, maybe not because we feel good about it, punching them in the nose every once in a while, which we won't be able to maybe, but because we have major interests involved. And we shouldn't forget that, the, that Russia is part of this also. Mm -hmm. Russia is now led by somebody who loves to play around with his nuclear arsenal and his military. So we have a very, very important task of trying to keep nuclear weapons under control. And I can't think of a better way of doing it, at least helping to contribute to it, than doing these discussions with Iran. Um, both of you, though, allude to the fact that this was very difficult to sell to the American people. And I think it's actually quite interesting that you know the Iranian, the, the agreement was never really approved by the Senate or the, right. the, the United States. It, it really, in a sense, had to rest on an executive action and then the the reluctance of the Senate ultimately to veto or prevent it. Um, but you also raise Ambassador Kornblum in your uh, comment where I'd like to, to just follow up initially. And that is the question of Russia. And I'd like to get both of you at least to, to say a little bit about that. Uh, we are dealing with a Russia that poisons its political opponents, that interferes in American elections, that um, carries out uh, policies around the world that we find quite hostile. Um, yes, during the Cold War, we had to deal with the Soviet Union, make agreements. Um, is there, a, is engagement with Vladimir Putin, to borrow from Ambassador Pickering's notion that we have to have both engagement and, and strength, is engagement with Vladimir Putin possible? And, and what is the way to proceed with him? And maybe um, I'll start with you, Ambassador Kornblum, on this one and just ask, what do you think is the best uh, approach to dealing with uh, Vladimir Putin's Russia? Well, I, as I mentioned, I spent most of my working life dealing with Russia. <laughs> I never lived in Russia. I don't speak Russian, but I spent most of my professional life dealing with Russia one way or the other. And if there was one thing I learned, it was that it is possible to make progress with them as long as you have made clear to them what the limits are and what you're willing to do. And it, at times in our history, we've forgotten those. Either we were much too aggressive vis-a-vis uh, -vis them because we didn't allow ourselves 
the ability to be pragmatic about things, or we were much too desirous of somehow uh, reaching an agreement with them. And um, there is both schools of thought are present in the United States uh, political debate right now and, and the think tanks in Washington. My own view is that we need to re-engage with Russia without question. We actually have a very good, found a good, a very useful foundation for doing so, and that's arms control, which after all was the very first engagement that we had with Russia with the nuclear test ban treaty in the 1960s. Uh, for whatever reason, we don't need to assign any blame to anybody. The arms control regimes, there were several, the arms control regimes have started to fade away. And I noticed that here at the end of the election campaign, the Trump administration seems now to want to get this, to keep the START agreement alive. I'm perfectly in favor of that, but there are lots of other ones that we could also keep alive. But the, 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 the reason that President Kennedy chose nuclear test ban treaty at the beginning, chose arms control at the, the very beginning of this process, which later became known as detente, was because it was urgent, it was definable, and it was ultimately doable. And right now, there are lots of things which are not so doable with Russia. The whole question of Ukraine, for example, the whole question of the uh, uh, Russian, um, however you wish to define it, meddling in our affairs, the whole cyber warfare thing. They're very difficult to do. What is definable and doable is arms control. And if I were in charge, I hope that the new president uh, is, is thinking about it in the same regard. If I were in charge, I would put a good deal of effort. I would try to come up with a larger agenda, not just arms control. I would, I would seek to engage Putin, but not in the way either that it was done in the Obama administration, which, if I may be frank, I thought was sort of not very level-headed or the way it's being done now, which is essentially zero other than whatever the president's personal relations with Putin are, I would try to do it in the way that President Kennedy started to do it, and it was carried on and other presidents, and start with something which is achievable, and certainly arms control is achievable. Now I'll, ask, I'll add a, a complicating, fact, complicating factor here. One of the reasons that some people, for example, including in the current administration, thought that the, the famous and difficult INF agreement was no longer valid, was not because of American or Russian behavior, but because Chinese is, China is part of the equation. And so China has to be part of this equation. But if you go back to Henry Kissinger, the entire foundation of his um, detente theories, strategy, was triangulization with Russia, the United States, and China. Now, is that doable? I don't know. I, I really don't know. But I think that we will not gain too much credibility for arms control if we don't somehow get China hooked into it. Oh, which, which raises a, a number of questions. Ambassador Pickering, what do you think is our, our way of approaching Russia, especially a Russia that does behave in so many ways uh, between the annexation of Crimea and the fueling of a insurgency in the Ukraine, the poisoning of political opposition. What do we do with a Russia like that? Uh, let me um, begin by saying a couple of things. Um, I began my career with the negotiations for the nuclear test ban treaty in the Kennedy administration. <laughs> and actually had as a, as a job to prepare a draft of a comprehensive test ban treaty during that period of time. Um, and I came very close to the end of my career, not finally the end, uh, as three years and change as ambassador in Russia. So while I was not a Russia or Soviet expert, I had opportunities in both occasions to see things that I thought were very valuable. And everything that John has said, I agree with. And I think that add one dimension to it. Uh, I was around when President Kennedy made a remarkable speech at American University, which opened up the whole question of arms control and disarmament, which had been fraught. Uh, with differences between the parties and between defense and state. And he did a good bit in carrying that over. And the limited test ban treaty, which began his uh, successes in disarmament, was in many ways uh, almost overturned uh, by the Cuban Missile Crisis, by the Soviet move of uh, 
uh, of mid-range missiles in large numbers to Cuba, but something that I think we don't have, haven't paid enough attention to. Uh, two years ago in an arms control discussion in Moscow with Americans and Russians, there were five Russian uh, Soviet general officers. And one of the individuals on the Russian side in that discussion said, there's present among us a man who in much younger age was a lieutenant colonel and took his battalion of missiles to Cuba. Um, and we looked and certainly that man nodded. He was named. And he said, the thing you probably don't know is when he took those with him, he took the nuclear warheads. And he had permission to use the nuclear warheads if America invaded Cuba. Um, and there were a lot of people who were wishing to invade Cuba at that time. I think it was the care, the understanding of President Kennedy and his ability to find an answer in mutual reciprocal steps uh, which he so configured that it was in a sense a political plus. But since then, after 10 years of examination, it became clear to the United States and to the Soviet Union that we had come closer then to what neither of us wanted and both of us thought should be anathema, uh, that we really dug in on trying to build stability in the mutual nuclear posture. And as John has said, that began to open other doors for other kinds of accomplishments, particularly in the last five years of the Soviet Union. And I was around for the next three and a half, four years of Russia. Uh, and in many cases, we were able to do business, not necessarily because they had no other alternative, but because we had had this long experience uh, of looking into the abyss and seeing our existence at risk and trying to take steps that in one way or another prevented that from happening. Over the course of our historical career, uh, we had a Soviet Lieutenant Colonel in charge of their National Command Center notifying operation, who was told one day that there were 200 American missiles on the way. And he did something that was unthinkable he decided not to pass the information up because he distrusted his own system's reporting capabilities. And we had a similar incident as Big Brzezinski as national security advisor near the end of his first year was awakened at three o'clock in the morning, that proverbial call by the National Military Command Center at the Pentagon. And he was told, Mr. National Security Advisor, we have 200 Russian missiles coming in. Uh, and we suggest it's time to notify the president. There are only a few minutes left to make a decision. And Spig said, are you absolutely sure of this? And they said, we've checked and rechecked. And he said, go back and check again. Uh, and they called him back and said, we've checked again. And we believe the question is the same. Spig cogitated for a few minutes and started to dial or press the phone. When it called back and said, we've rechecked, it's a colossal error an exercise tape showing a Soviet attack got mixed up in our electronics and became the real information. Uh, and Zbig and that Lieutenant Colonel uh, saved us from the stupidity of an accidental approach to an attack, which proves that we need to do more and to do better, uh, and that Russia is very important. China is growing in importance. But China is in the 300 warhead class, some slight growth. Russia and the United States at the top of the Cold War had between them 70,000 nuclear weapons, more or less. We are down to a joint possession of about 12,000, six on a side. Uh, and we do need vitally to keep the New START agreement going, even if it's only for a year, which is sort of the current proposal. Now, can we believe Putin is interested in anything? Well, Putin four times has said he will extend New START without any conditions on his side. So it's very clear that he understands at least the necessity of building the kind of stability. And John, I think is 100% right. If we can deal with the existential threats and build a record of, of action that's been completed, 
and verified, we can begin to build back the trust that's not in the system. Putin in many ways has taken advantage uh, of some of the mistakes that we have made, including our initiatives in getting out of arms control arrangements to support his own popularity in Russia, something he cares very heavily about uh, by being more nationalist, more sphere of influence oriented, more belligerent about the United States, and every excuse we give him to use that as his own domestic puffing propaganda is something he grabs onto because he sees his own future in trouble and needs to have that popularity, even in the Russian system, to be able to stay in charge. And he knows very well that in the system he's built on top of communism, the succession of leadership is not established. Much like the czars, you had to die before somebody else came in. Much like the Soviets, you had to be dismissed before somebody else came in. And the questions of your life after that were on tenterhooks. So this is a very important part of the political world in which we live. Ukraine is going to be hard as hell to solve, but we need to be tough about it. I think we need to play a slightly larger role the Europeans have tried at the so-called Minsk agreements, but have never been able to keep those agreements kept on the Russian side. And to some extent, the Ukrainians have had some of their own slippage. But we need something more solid than what we have. And we need something that over a period of time will work to the goal of the uh, irredentist forces in Eastern Ukraine having to stay part of that country, perhaps with autonomy, I do not know. But in one way or another, it has to be something the Ukrainians agree to. Uh, but it also has to get the green men and the other folks out of the picture. Uh, and hopefully that will be something that the next administration in the United States, uh, rather than uh, uh, extending uh, a loving kiss to Putin, will in one way or another speak sharply and carry a big stick. You raise, a, you raise an interesting point, and it's one that uh, I want to bring up. Uh, since John, uh, since Ambassador Kornblum was in Germany for, uh, as ambassador, um, this week Politico had an argument or a, an article about those Germans with a, an expletive connected to it. And the, the argument being, does the United States, can the United States uh, maybe with a new administration, uh, recreate some of the cooperation with Europe uh, that might allow it to do things such as Ambassador Pickering was discussing, namely uh, have real agreements with uh, 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 Russia. Um, are our interests and Europe's interests in that sense ones that can be brought together or have we really diverged rather strongly over the last few years in how we approach problems like Russia and China, and that uh, this issue with Germany, which goes back uh, not just to the Trump, not just the Trump period, but earlier. And I'm wondering what, as, as someone who knows and lives in Germany and, and is, uh, is, is quite conscious of the politics of that country, uh, whether Ambassador Kornblum, you think there is the potential for a more cooperative approach with Germany that could be used in relations with both Russia and China. Well, yes, I do. Um, one of the advantages of having been around a little while is that you've seen things come and go several times. Uh, we've had several of these kinds of eras with our European friends. But the fact is that we are joined with them. I once wrote an article in which I said, uh, we in Europe are planted in the same soil and we can't leave uh, take pull our roots out of Europe any more than they can pull their roots away from us. We are simply a, a, a community which has existed actually for 400 years. There's no, no question about that. The real question is not that. And I can tell you, I spend, I spend even now, thanks to Zoom, I spend um, several hours a week talking with German groups about what's going on. And um, there is no question about the, the fact that all that the Europeans in general want is for the United States to take account of their points of view, which often frustrate us, by the way. I'm not going to try and change it. They often frustrate us. 
Now, the, 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 I'll say two things about Germany because it's, I think it's very important. I did a project at the American Academy in Berlin two or three years ago, and it was called the New Strategic Triangle. And our, our conclusion was that the new strategic triangle is going to be a networked digital triangle. Much of the stuff that we talk about geographic is not so important. And that the two, the three feet of this triangle, the three points of this triangle, however you want to use it, are going to be China, the United States, and Germany, not Europe, but Germany. That's because the Germans are the largest in, in Europe, but also they're the most geographically well positioned. They are the only Europeans who really care about the East other than for trade, but Germany cares about it for an existential reason. And they are also, and I use this word as a term of the art, unrelenting. That is Europe is becoming German. I'll just tell you this very directly. It's becoming German, but not in a bad way. It's as we think about from the past, Rather that Germany is just doesn't stop, it doesn't give up. And uh, Angela Merkel is not only one of the most respected persons in the world, she is the voice of Europe. Now, I don't want to overdo this, but the fact is it shows that the United States has a big multiplier of its interests in Europe. This is what I've always tried to argue. We're not doing the Europeans any favor. If you went to a new president and said, I've got this plan for you. There are 500 million people over there and all they want to do is to have us lead them. Is that okay? Almost anybody would say yes, except in the last 20 years, three American presidents have said no, that they didn't want to lead us. And this has a little bit to do with who we are. We're an immigrant country. We don't like to make compromises with the countries we left. Let's just be blunt about it. That's why we're here. If we wanted to stay there, we would have stayed there, but we didn't. And so it, it, it takes a little bit more effort on our part to understand that the kind of approach we had after World War II, which was simply necessary, it was either do what we did or the world was going to go down the drain. That, that kind of approach is still worthwhile because we gain tremendously from it. I can tell you, I really do have lots of years of experience people honor and, and welcome and wait for the United States continuously. When the Ukrainian crisis came up and uh, Barack Obama didn't want to become involved, Angela Merkel said to me personally, I wasn't ambassador then, but I do have, I do sort of know her. She said, doesn't your president realize we can't do this? We need you to do this for us. And this is something which is hard for Americans to understand that we are the, 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 the putty, the glue, the framework, whatever you want to call it, that holds all this together. And if it means that we might sometimes have to hold back a bit, we have to referee a little bit, then that's the, the advantages we get. When you have a few people like Tom and me who earn no money and who get no respect most of the time, that we were out there doing, making sure that America had a strong position in, not only in Europe, but also in Asia. And that this America wins from this. We never lose from it. We may sometimes have to swallow our pride, which may be the hardest thing of all, but we don't lose from it. And this is what, again, if I may, I know uh, some of your students are here, if I may speak to the future. The next chapter of American history, whether it be a digital world, whether it be a multipolar world, who knows what it's going to be. But America is going to win by being open and gracious to others and not by being rambunctious and, 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 and aggressive against each other. That's a sign of weakness. And we've been weak in the past 15 years or so. We just have to be honest about it. So that's why I think Germany is important, but it's important mostly because it gives us this, this projection of our interests all the way into the center of Asia. Um. I, I, I have many more questions, but I want to ask Pat, are there some questions in the chat that we might want to turn to the audience now, actually? Um, yes, Professor Schwartz, thanks uh, so much for that. We do have uh, some questions uh, in the queue and coming in via Twitter on our uh, Facebook Live uh, connection. Let me start with um, a question on uh, Russia, and I'm going to uh, add combine two questions here. Angela Weck, who's with us in the broadcast, and Angela is the 
uh, Executive Director of the Peoria World Affairs Council. So we salute our sister uh, World Affairs Council there. And, and we'll see if, uh, uh, what's the saying, if this flies in Peoria, if it... <laughs> it play in Peoria. <laughs> play, yes. play, in, play in Peoria. It play in Peoria. So uh, Angela asks, what advice would you give the president uh, for dealing with Russia concerning Ukraine, Syria, Venezuela, and how would that advice differ depending on whether it is Trump or Biden? Ambassador Pickering, do you want to take that? And I've got a, a uh, follow-up uh, for Ambassador Kornblum. Uh, and it is uh, via Twitter. Ambassador Kornblum, what do you make of the bizarre relationship between Donald Trump and Vladimir Putin? Ambassador Pickering, uh, the first part. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, I think I've already addressed the question of Ukraine in, in some regard. I think a greater and more active role on the part of the United States to support and be part of the European consortium in something called the Normandy Group, which has almost died out, but uh, can help. Uh, an effort to deal with Ukraine on the basis of reinforcing and strengthening uh, and hopefully monitoring the, MISC, the Minsk Group Accords, uh, an approach which in many ways still is required uh, to build the Ukrainian economy, which was its weakness was one of the major questions that's got us into this, uh, to fight corruption and to use uh, uh, the new president of the Ukraine, who seems to be moving in that direction, to support and strengthen that. So internal problems do not debilitate Ukraine the way they did uh, four or five years ago when this whole thing started. To have as a clear objective, Ukraine free and whole within its boundaries, to look at Ukraine potentially, at least for the next decade or so, as a bridge state between Europe and the United States and the economies in the East. It has been configured in many ways by its uh, uh, being part of the Soviet Union in that direction. Uh, there ought to be the possibility over time of perhaps some very wise uh, heads uh, knowledgeable about both the Eastern economies and the Western economies to see whether that bridge function could be a little more institutionalized, whether Ukraine could be some kind of a useful part of the European Union, while it is some sometime a, a useful part of essentially uh, the customs union to the east of it. These are all useful ideas. Uh, they have to be pursued with some care. They will take time. They are diplomatic. On Syria, uh, my view is that while many people believe that Russia and President Assad have won the war, I think it'll be a long time before they see the fruits of victory. I could be wrong, but that's been my experience. Uh, we began a year and a half ago counting their victory as pretty much inevitable. Uh, but there is a political workout that has to take place. And so far, neither Russia nor Turkey nor President Assad nor with UN help have they been able to work out anything that in one way or another looks like either a ceasefire or beyond that, a new government for Syria, which could be broadly acceptable. Uh, Russia in this sense has both achieved a new structure and a new role in the Middle East and can speak to everybody. But Russia has shown up until now an insufficiency of capacity to make things happen. Uh, and going back to what John said and what I started out with, we are, in effect, the reference point for many people when it comes to international problems. I do not see us diving into Syria now, but I see us watching and waiting for that opportunity when perhaps our heft, uh, our innovative capacity, and our diplomatic approaches can be useful in working out something in Syria. I think that we have a small number of troops in eastern Syria I think we should keep them there, both to keep the Islamic State from becoming resurgent, and secondly, to continue to support our friends, the Kurds, who have been betrayed many times by many allies, and recently several times by the United States, but who at least deserve respect for the sacrifices they have made for our joint interests. And while the notion of a Kurdish state seems to be totally beyond the capacity of anybody to produce. We need to be loyal to them 
as members of the Syrian polity in a way that at the end of this, they have respect and dignity and a place of equality in the future of Syria. Venezuela is one hell of a morass. And I wish I could tell you there was an easy way out. Most of us who have dealt with it have believed that there is an electoral out. Uh, but the coming elections, which are Maduro only, Maduro run, Maduro patronized, and likely to be Maduro manipulated, are not the answer. So far, the international community, as much as it has come together, has not yet been able to approach the question of a negotiated way out. The Trump administration, I have to give them credit for, has put some ideas on the table, which I think could open the door to negotiations for a future, uh, which would be elections that would take place, in my humble view, under the strictest and widest international supervision to prevent jiggery pokey, pokery and finagling and give the Venezuelan people an opportunity to choose their own successors. Those elections could be taking place for a new National Assembly. They could be taking place for a new president. Whatever it is, the Venezuelans can be brought to agree to. Unfortunately, these days, I do not see them taking place without some very significant continued pressure on Maduro uh, and with some flexibility in getting those things started. Uh, I wish that our friends in Latin America would be more united, more committed, and more focused around this because the hemisphere counts and the words of the hemisphere inside the hemisphere uh, with our own with them uh, could make, I think, a, a better difference over the longer term, but it'll take time. Russian intervention and Iranian participation in Venezuela are not helpful. Maybe it's time to have, once again, some heart-to-heart -heart talks with the Russians about what could be done. Uh, Russia is there mainly to stir up support for, for Putin at home and to stir up trouble for us here. Uh, its long-term interest in the future of Venezuela is very narrow, very focused, and very Russian, and something that I think over a period of time we could convince them is dangerous and debilitating, and they could be helpful in a solution. Whether they are absolutely necessary or not for that solution is hard. Uh, much can be said about Iran, uh, but it will take uh, a relationship with both of those countries we do not have and which may take us some time to achieve. Master Kornblum, Putin and Trump. What's, what's Putin going Trump on? Or Putin and Biden, either, both of them. Well, <clears throat> I don't know what the relationship between Putin and Trump is. I'm suspicious about it. But I think it's better that we try to think about Russia regardless of what their relationship is. We have a choice now in Russia, which we had also 50 years ago, right this year. And that is, do we treat Russia as a eternal enemy for whom something resembling regime change is the only way to solve it? Or do we try to do something with this very difficult, enigmatic, complex, frustrating, another 20 words could be added to that country. 20 years ago, 50 years ago right now, we began with the era of detente, which President Kennedy actually started, by the way. Um, I had lots to do. I knew very well personally, Willie Brand and Agor Barr and these people. To a man, they always said to me, our inspiration came from John F. Kennedy and, and, and the, uh, the, the nuclear testing agreement. So the Americans were the ones who made the move that, with his famous speech in uh, American University. We have to do that again. And we went through a phase where we had lots of progress. I myself was a major participant in the whole setting up of the so-called post-Cold War security order with Russia. I actually drafted many of the documents. We thought that we had begun something new, but it went sour fairly rapidly. And we now have to start all over again, basically. And I think starting all over again means, first, that we make a basic decision that we're not gonna turn Russia into Peoria. 
if I may put it that way. <laughs> it's, it's Russia is going to be Russia. <laughs> but at the same time, we can't expect that we're going to have a Russia that's our, that's our enemy. There is, there are democratic forces in Russia, strong democratic forces. There are people who believe in change in Russia. And uh, we have really only one option, and that is to try to work with these forces in a positive way, while at the same time, of course, doing what we can, as we were talking earlier, in a pragmatic way about things such as arms control, trade, and other things. Now, what is Putin's psychology? I have the slightest idea. I think his psychology right now is survival. Anybody who's been Russian president for 20 years must feel uh, steps uh, around his door every night wondering whether he's still going to be there. So Putin has a very strong interest in survival. And there's no reason why the American president can't help him uh, deal with that, that interest. But the basic, so I have no idea how, what Putin's psychology is or how we should deal with him. What I do think is that we should not give up on Russia. And there is too much it's, it's very interesting, both the people who are sort of hardliners against Russia and those who want to have a more, shall we say, positive approach to Russia, always forget civil society. And I've had a lot of debates, by the way, with experts in Washington because I'm a big believer in civil society. One of my bigger long-term efforts was with the Helsinki process with civil society. We have to help the Russians build civil society without seeming to be interfering. But if we give up on Russia and treat them as an eternal enemy, you know where that's going to end. That's going to end in compromises. You cannot compromise with a dictatorship. And then if, if we really believe that it is an eternal dictatorship, we will end up with compromises. We'll end up giving up our, our positions. We'll end up giving up our interests. And we have some very, very important allies the Baltic states, Poland, but also Georgia and Armenia and Ukraine, who depend upon us not to give up on civil society because they are living in civil society. I would say one last comment upon on Ukraine. My wife is a daughter of Ukrainian refugees and she spent most of last year in Ukraine. And that country is already a miracle in the sense that it went from being a SSR of the Soviet Union to being quite a democratic country within 20 years. It's got corruption, it's got territorial issues, it's got differences between East and West, it's got all sorts of things. Who doesn't? But when you go to Ukraine, you know you're in a Western country, you're not in Russia. And, and Ukraine, I agree completely with Tom, we need to help Ukraine. We don't want Ukraine to have total enmity with Russia for the rest of the time, that this wouldn't work. We have to help Ukraine find a niche there, which is part of the West, but also a bridge to Russia and to the East. Thanks for that. Uh, I'm going to combine two questions uh, here. If I had a chance to ask a question, and I guess I'm not allowed to, but uh, Ambassador Kornblum, I, I would ask you the question, if Europe is becoming Germany, does, will that mean the trains in Italy will start to run on time? But I, I, I will leave that for another time. Yeah, that's, um, a, very, that's a very big issue. Uh, which, <laughs> Mm -hmm. The is no. <laughs> uh, two questions here, and we'll, we'll bundle these together. Uh, for Ambassador uh, Pickering, uh, we'll, we'll, give, uh, we'll give you a first crack on this, uh, somewhat provocative. Can you comment on the politicization of the State Department as a tool to further the personal political interests of the President and the Secretary of State? And, uh, I'd be from delighted. Okay, I'll, I'll wait for the second one. You go ahead if you want with it, I'll, I'll wait. I, I was, I was going to ask uh, uh, of Ambassador Kornblum from Ambassador Charles Bowers, a member of our uh, Tennessee World Affairs Council Board of Directors. Uh, Ambassador Bowers asks, uh, the US military came out of Vietnam as a broken institution. There are many who believe the US Foreign Service will emerge from the Trump administration, broken, gutted, and overstretched. How do we recreate a U.S. diplomatic corps that is the envy of their peers around the world and strongly supported by the American public? So Ambassador Kornblum, if you could think about that one for a minute, and Ambassador Pickering, if you could take the question about politicization. Sure, they're part of the same whole, but politicization of the State Department is obviously something that 
very much in mind of President Trump and his administration. Uh, for example, uh, I mentioned earlier, I think, the scything through of the top grades in the Foreign Service in terms of pushing people out. And certainly, missing people without reason is illegal, but they found ways to put people in positions they wouldn't want to work in or offer them nothing in the way of a serious job in order to get the move. Uh, but over time, every individual in the top grade in the career ambassador side of the State Department went out uh, during the early part of the Trump administration. Conservatively, 45% of the next group went out and 20% or more of the next group down. So of the top three groups in rank in the State Department, you can see what happened. And these are people with 15, 20, 25 years experience. That doesn't grow on trees and it's not something you hire off the street. And with greatest respect, working in government is different than working in industry. In industry, and I've worked in industry, you have certain financial and other commitments that you want to make as a firm. In government, you have 435 members of the House of Representatives and 100 in the Senate and the White House, and you work for all of them and for all of the people. And each one of those individuals feels ownership. Uh, back in 1870, we decided that political appointments of the civil service led to corruption, desuetude, poor performance, and failure. We began by reforming the civil service. In the 1920s, it became clear that in the State Department, we needed to create a professional. All of the big countries had professional diplomats. We did not. Uh, in 1924, we passed an act of Congress establishing that. It was based on the idea that it should be like our military with respect to promotions and assignments and service. It is one of the few places in government where there are six to eight ways we can take people out of the service for failure of performance. Uh, and that's unusual because in the civil service, you have to prove a case in order to do that. So people serve in a way on a basis of a merit and highly competitive professional system. Uh, in the State Department, uh, the most important jobs, and John Kornblum had one for quite a while, are the Assistant Secretaries of State. There are 28 such jobs, uh, and right now there is only one professional in those 28 appointments, where normally in any administration, at least two-thirds of those jobs would be professional. That one professional is there because the law requires a professional to serve in that job as head of personnel of the State Department. Uh, probably if the law hadn't required, there would be no move in that direction. Uh, there are efforts to bring into the State Department uh, through the civil service process, uh, not requiring exams anymore, but applications, individuals who will then be seated into the bureaucracy as what are essentially political servants of the last administration. Uh, they have tenure in their job. Uh, they are, in effect, individuals who are taking increasingly the jobs of the Foreign Service in Washington, who are, by definition, available for world worldwide service and rotate every three years. So what we are doing is replacing uh, a, a merit-based, military-type organized professional career service with individuals who are in one way or another pretty much fixed in place and in time and have jobs almost for life and rarely can, rarely can be moved uh, without a, a huge problem. Uh, that's the politicization both at the top and through the, the web, the fiber uh, of the Washington bureaucracy of the State Department. And I think that that we need to go back and deal with if you want to read something well written and very succinct about this in the current edition of Foreign Affairs, William Burns and Linda Thomas Greenfield have done a very, very decent, clear, well written expose of the problem and some of the things that need to be done about it. 
Uh, Ambassador Corman, I think uh, that probably got to the nub of, of that question. Uh, we're closing in on time here. So I've got, uh, I've got one more uh, general question and then a closing question uh, that I'll ask of both of you. This uh, uh, question comes from Austin Travis, a student at Lipscomb University here in Nashville. He uh, says we've rejected, this might be uh, kind of detailed uh, if you're not a, uh, an East Asia hand. Uh, we've rejected Chinese claims in the South China Sea, but we haven't done the same in the East China Sea, the Senkaku Diaoyu Islands. Why is there any scenario in which the US begins taking sides in the East China Sea? I, I would uh, add, if I could, that uh, the United States has stated that the, uh, the islands are administered by uh, Japan, Senkaku Islands, and that uh, we recognize that uh, as part of Japan, we would uh, consider them to fall under our joint defense uh, arrangement. Uh, feel free to add any comment to that if you'd like. Well, not a whole lot I can say to that. You said exactly the right thing. I would only say that um, these are the kind of issues which become important if everything else falls apart. Uh, and right now, everything else hasn't fallen apart. And so, it's as you said, it's very much fun sometimes to go through these things. You could you could talk about the Sakhalin problem with Japan, also with Russia. I mean, there's a whole lot of this stuff going on. The real question is, are we going to put a framework back in place? And here I would put in a, a word, which, by the way, both Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump opposed in the last election for the so-called Trans-Pacific Partnership, which is a actual, I think myself, brilliant diplomatic construction to help the United States build an alliance around China. And it was turned down for domestic political reasons, which I can understand, but it's too bad. I hope that, I hope myself that the next president, if he's a president Biden, will resurrect both the Trans-Pacific Partnership and the Transatlantic Partnership, which was a similar thing. These are the kind of ways in this new digital world that the United States is gonna exercise influence, not necessarily through NATO, although it's very important, I'm a big aficionado of NATO, but we have to get into this new kind of relationship and the Transatlantic Partnership and the, and the Trans-Pacific Partnership, both were ways of doing that. They were really quite creative and came out of the American bureaucracy, mm -hmm. by the way. And um, I hope that uh, mm -hmm. we will yeah. pick them up again. Let me uh, ask in our last uh, couple of minutes here, a, a question from our Facebook uh, live broadcast. Uh, and I think this is a good uh, end, ending question here. Tony Blinken, a top advisor to Joe Biden told a podcast today that the U.S. needed to ensure the power of its example, not the example of its power. What can you tell our countrymen about the use of soft power and that engagement in the world is in our interests? And, and I guess uh, I would encourage you to uh, provide a, uh, a, a closing slogan for world affairs councils to use to uh, inspire new membership. Well, maybe you want me to start on that one, Patrick? Yes, sir. Um, I think uh, the real good combination, in my view, is what Joe Nye, the originator of soft power, came later to call smart power. And that was the combination of firmness and determination when you needed it, together with respect and the ability to negotiate and to achieve your objective short of the use of force. My view is the use of force should be for the defense of the country country, and it should be the last, not the first option used, that diplomacy and soft power have many attributes. I can think of nothing more important than our programs of student and personal and high school and business and labor exchange, short visits and long visits, the people getting to know each other, building on the civil society piece and the approach that obviously makes some sense. But soft power also includes a great deal else. It includes investment, it includes favorable trade, it includes supporting international institutions that can help us make the world run smoothly. If we did not have all of the United Nations specialized agencies, which cover everything from making sure airplanes don't crash together in the, in the sky, to the banking system works, uh, to international help uh, to the needy takes place, uh, on a coordinated basis, we would have to invent all of that. And, and that's one of the great pillars of, of the kind of uh, approach uh, we have adopted and supported 
Uh, and in the, in the exception of the, of the present administration, uh, very unfortunately, has become a hallmark of what America is for. And so America, in many ways, is soft power and I hope smart power. Uh, and the association is real. And people continue to look to us uh, to lead. So the door is open for us to resume that. Uh, final point, it took a long while for President Obama to claw his way back from George W. Bush's decision on Iraq. It was never totally achieved, although he did a great deal. Uh, but the time ratio of getting into trouble uh, and the time ratio to get out of the trouble is probably 100 to 1. One simple stupid error in a few seconds uh, can create something that it takes you hundreds of hundreds of days to recover from. So where we are now is not something that magically can be redetermined but it is a huge burden on the next president. And let us hope, in fact, that we begin that process very soon. Ambassador Kornblum? Well, I agree with that. Um, there is a combination of approaches which are necessary. And um, as, during the Cold War, and especially in years after the Cold War and after 9-11, which brought a certain wartime spirit to the United States, we tended to forget about the importance of our example, of our civilizational example. If you've, I've lived in Europe now for the last 23 years uninterrupted, and I can tell you that there is no other reference point in the world for most Europeans other than the United States. And certainly not other Europeans, that's the interesting thing that they would, shoot me for saying this, they don't consider each other to be their reference points. They consider us to be the mutual reference point. George Kennan once said in one of his memoirs, which I read very, very thoroughly when I was a young person, that the, in the end, American foreign policy is based on the example of our society, not on our diplomacy or our military. And that's exactly the case. And so we have to get back to that the other example we can use is, both Tom and I experienced it, the Vietnam War and the aftermath. There were lots of people who said that America was finished in the world. The Vietnam War was such a horrible disaster that we would never come back. And within 10 years, we were back, more than less than 10 years, within five or six years, we were back doing what we had always done. So there's, there's no reason for us to be defeatist about where the United States is right now. There's no reason for us to think that the world has lost its trust in the United States. When, when, when George H.W. Bush, who had, shall we say, didn't have exactly a, a good hand in Europe, when he left office, 15% of those asked in polls, do you trust the United States, said yes. Two years later, after Barack Obama was there, 90% said they trusted the United States. So we are anything but a defeated power. The, who are the people who, leave aside Trump, who is very much in the news, who do people look up and talk, talk about and deal with in, in Europe right now, but also China, also Japan? Amazon, Facebook, Google, Zoom, as we're profiting from. In other words, we are already defining the 21st century for the world and we shouldn't, we shouldn't say that just because we've had an infelicitous hand on our politics and diplomacy, which we have, by the way, that, we, that the strength of American society just isn't there. But what we need now is that, go back to my first comment, we need to go back to the basic principles and to the statecraft of it and not think only that, well, we've got Facebook and everything, we can do anything we want. That's certainly not the case. We have to have good, gracious, and 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 uh, focused uh, politics and diplomacy also. But the fact is, that we are not in any way in a in a declining situation. If anything, uh, people are worried about our power again right now. Well, that's terrific. We've uh, run out of time. Uh, I, I would gladly listen to uh, your insights and perspectives for for many more hours and. We hope to have you back uh, at some point. Uh, but on behalf of the Tennessee World Affairs Council, the uh, National Area Chamber of Commerce, the Belmont Center for International Business, 
I would uh, like to send my uh, great thanks to Professor Thomas Schwartz for being a friend of the World Affairs Council and moderating uh, programs like this, Ambassador John Kornblum and Ambassador Thomas Pickering for your lifelong uh, service to the United States and your continued sharing uh, generously of your wisdom and perspective on uh, these issues. Uh, lastly, I would uh, remind people uh, to become members of the World Affairs Council. And as Ambassador Pickering uh, noted, please go out and vote. Whether you're red or blue, please vote. And uh, hopefully there'll be no, uh, to borrow a phrase, jiggery pokery involved. I will uh, hang on to that one. Thank you, Ambassador Pickering, for that. Thank Ambassador well. Kornblum, thanks so much, Thank Tom. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks very much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye, Bye, Tom. Have a good, have Bye -bye. A good evening. Bye, right, John. Thank you. Thank you very much, Patrick. And, and thank you, Professor uh, Schwartz. Thank you.